Wow, what an introduction. Thank you, Bill. Um, right, can we have the first picture, please? Okay. It was back in it's November 1982 when I was 13 years old and I picked up the review section of the Sunday Times newspaper in London. And there, right across the top, was this picture. And underneath was the headline, Aristocrats, Alcohol and Adultery. <laughs> the article was the serialization of a book called White Mischief, which told the story of the unsolved murder of a British Earl in Arab. British Earl in Kenya during the Second World War. And this first part of the serialization was about his first wife, Idina Sackville, who divorced no less than five times, but he was her third husband. When they married, she was 30, he was 22. It was 1924, and it was quite progressive at the time. Um, it told the story of how Idina would welcome her weekend guests in her bathroom as she lay naked in the bath and served them cocktails. And then after dinner and a great many more cocktails, she would organize games which would determine who was going to end up in whose bedroom for the night. And um, she also, I mean, the thing that really grabbed me about her, though, was that she wasn't born a great beauty, yet made herself irresistible to men. Apparently, when she walked into a room, it just came a light. She had it. And through sort of effort and just style, she managed to get where she wanted. She made herself very attractive to the opposite sex. My younger sister wanted to read this article and I said no I'm 13 I can read it you are 11 you cannot um, but she didn't easily take no so we had an argument and I ended up taking the article to my parents who were sitting next door and as I showed it to them my mother began to go red and my father began to laugh and he said you have to tell them and my mother said this woman was my grandmother I mean, I was knocked for six. I said, why didn't you tell us earlier? And she said, we didn't want you to think her a role model. <laughs> I was like, not role model, you know, to suddenly discover this when you're 13. I mean, I was hooked. I knew I could break a few rules. I'd been sent off to boarding school rather brutally aged 10. And I can remember rapidly being hauled in front of the very, very tall and very, very scary headmaster who boomed down at me saying, Francis Howell, rules are made to be broken, but not to the extent that you do. <laughs> um, so I thought, you know, maybe I can break, I mean, not, you know, some of the rules that Idina broke, maybe I could make myself attractive, you know, if I had a legendary seductress as a great grandmother, that gave me hope when I walked into those terrifying teenage parties, sort of early teens, and wondering, is anyone ever going to ask me to dance? You know, how am I going to cover up the fact that I haven't been asked to dance? And all those things. So this gave me, this gave me hope, and I thought she was amazing. But as I grew older and had children, my, well, just grew older generally, I, my perspective began to change because what Idina had done, and the reason she was known as the bolter, was that she had run off and left her husband, my great-grandfather, and their two small children and run off to Kenya with husband number two. And part of me was, as, as I had my own children, was sort of appalled that she'd done that. But then I became increasingly fascinated as to why she'd done it. You know, what had driven her to break such a fundamental rule, to sort of cross the Rubicon in that way? And then what were the consequences of that action? And I realized I was sort of tapping into quite a common feeling there. We, we do wonder, we look at rules and we wonder, what happens if you break them? What happens to the women or the people who break these rules? And you, if you read their stories and you read through the consequences, you live this rule-breaking experience vicariously and can then decide whether to do it or not yourself. And um, so this was sort of quite compelling, and I decided to write about her. But strangely, I was so daunted by her story and the complexity and the fact it involved lots of other sort of fav famous people who had relatives still living that I decided I'd write a different story first. And can we have next slide? And this was about, as Bill said, another great-grandmother of mine. And her name was Lilla. I last saw her at the same age that I first found out about Idina, 13, obviously, seminal age. And she was almost 101. And she'd been born in China in the 1880s. And she was a younger, identical twin. 
And her story, as I wrote it, was a story of sort of both bravery and foolhardiness. She, when she was interned, she broke many rules in life, but the key one was when she was interned by the Japanese in China in the Second World War, she broke the camp rules, which was a seriously sort of life-threatening thing to do, and she very secretly wrote and compiled a fantasy cookbook of written as though the war wasn't happening at all. They were back in the 1930s, high living in Shanghai. And um, this, when I studied it, I said, you know, why had she done this? And it was a question of self-preservation. In order to keep her morale up, she'd done this, and it worked. She survived. But then I moved on to Idina. And I was lucky enough to have diaries of my great-grandfather, which sort of documented the end of this marriage. And I realized that she, too, had acted out of a sense of self-preservation, miserably unhappy. She felt she could literally no longer exist, no longer be a good mother to her children, and taking two young boys away from a wealthy, stable family in England and taking them to Kenya was unheard of. So she had to give up the children. But in Idina's case, this act of self-preservation led to her self-destruction because the second marriage fell apart quickly. She fell into arm after arm of lover after lover, just looking for that happiness which she'd lost. She took drugs, she drank. They sort of, in the early 20s in London and Paris, they were almost sort of nihilistic in a way. Um, however, just because she couldn't ever be anything but just a little bit glamorous and exciting, she did still manage to break two rules. Instead of becoming totally dissolute, she remained impossibly glamorous. She had a great friend called Rosita Forbes who tr crossed the Sahara disguised as a man's man and wrote of traveling with Idina that she was the best traveling companion. And even in, in the jungle in the middle of the Congo, Idina managed to emerge from her tent looking as though she'd come out of tissue paper. It was almost as though you, know, you had to keep, if you kept that glamour up, you were all right. The other thing was, is, although she had lots of lovers, she didn't steal, take other people's husbands. There's a great line that, saying that she never stole other people's husbands, she just picked the ones up that had been left lying around. <laughs> um, I'm told that was said by the Queen Mother, but not so certainly that you can actually write it down. Que the Queen Mother was good, very good friends with her sister, who behaved only marginally better, but, you know, better. And, um, but this was gripping, you know, the self-destruction was gripping. Was it inevitable if you broke these rules in life, that you sort of stepped outside the normal boundaries, that you imploded like this? You know, was it, was it es escape inescapable? And then I began to get really quite cross. You know, why had she been so discriminated against for behaving like a man? And man wouldn't have been so, I mean, well, the extent of some of this happy valley set in Kenya wasn't well thought of. But, and then, you know, why had she had to suffer so much? For in fact, what she was doing, as other women of her, of her age were, was of forging pathways that future generations that we can follow, we can live a more liberated life because at some point some people went against the grain and really stepped outside society. She called herself a social outlaw and faced a lot of reprimand for it. Um, and, and, and as I thought through this, I realized how important these individual stories such as Idina's are because they are, these women in the past are, together as a mass, it's not just these individual acts, but together as a mass, they're literally stamping their way through the briars of tradition and prejudice and forcing social change. And that social change has affected what me and my contemporaries really can be as people today. And it wasn't just sort of sexually or leaving unhappy, mari leaving unhappy marriages that Idina and her generation when breaking the rules forced the change. But it was um, also, can we have the next? Thank you. Um, it was also politically. Idina, when she was 18, back turned 21, she couldn't vote. And nor could any woman in Britain, and not very many in the US. And in order to fight and campaign for the vote, women resorted to extreme violence. They, in Britain, they burnt down buildings. They s ran up and down the main shopping streets, smashing windows. They even did annoying things like block roads, stood up in the middle of theater performances and unfold banners or showered the audience with leaflets. And um, they chained themselves to railings, very famously. Uh, they, um, one woman even took a machete into the National Gallery and slashed a portrait of Venus as a great sort of protest. <laughs> 
against how women were viewed. And as a result, they literally banned women from museums and galleries for months. I mean, it, it, this was 1913 and 1914. It's Im unimaginable now. Um, but the leader of this violent movement was someone called Mrs. Pankhurst. Can we have the next one? And here is Mrs. Pankhurst being led away from the front gates of Buckingham Palace, which she was chaining herself to um, by two policemen. And you know, this is how the suffragettes had to operate. And she was extraordinary, Mrs. Pankhurst. She was prophet-like. She would go to a um, stand. She, crowds would gather to hear her speak. She would stand up, raise her arms, and tell them the only life worth living was one that you'd laid down for the cause, that you were literally prepared to sacrifice, starve yourself to death as a hunger striker if necessary. And, and as extreme as that sound, the fact that women couldn't vote then made me so angry that I really wanted to write about this, but I didn't want to write another biography of Mrs. Pankhurst. I wanted to write a story of one of her foot soldiers. And in this, I was inspired by the Bolter and Idina, because as Bill said, Idina's mother was an ardent campaigner for women's suffrage. But she believed very strongly that you could not campaign, should not campaign using the violence that Mrs. Pankhurst did. And she, um, this made me think that, you know, as often you get these movements, they're aiming towards the same cause and they're sort of close, divided and dislike each other. And um, this made me think, what would it have been like to have been, had a mother like this and been a young woman approaching the war and actually felt that no violence and the extreme disruption was the way to go and what would it have been like to have been sort of making these decisions as to what way to go and and being secretly slowly drawn into this rather sort of underworld movement and um, I decided to write a novel in that time called Park Lane I mean it's an extraordinary time for women because from 1914 or so through the first world war life for women transformed immeasurably i had the chance of having two ca very different young women, one ma in, living in one house in Park Lane, where in fact the Bolters family did live, uh, one maid and one debutante. And they both faced these incredibly narrow expectations, but over the World War I, and, and ironically the terrible tragedy, they're set free, not only sexually, because everyone misbehaved so badly, they had to have morality patrols patrolling the streets, um, but also they did things like sort of men's jobs. Can we have the next one? which should be the land army. The, you know, it, was, it was a huge fact that they were showing that women can do everything that men can do, so they worked on the land army. Next one. They drove ambulances, even at the front in France, and of course writing a novel is great fun because I can send my characters off to do all these things. And um, then they, the next one, they became motorcycle couriers. And there's something about this picture that sort of simultaneously makes me feel both sort of far and, and, and near, far from it and near to it. Firstly, I wonder, you know, would I have done that? Would that have been me? I did actually used to ride a motorcycle, although really not very successfully. It was a very short-lived mode of transportation for me and ended up in a pair of crutches quite rapidly. Um, but, you know, I looked at this woman. This woman is, could be one of us, but she was in a time that she could not vote. And I really think that we've sort of become complacent and we've, we've forgotten how hard women had to campaign and the barriers that had to be overcome. And things like the planned parenthood debate here, which shows that through complacency you stop fighting and the barriers begin to be rolled back again. And we're somehow letting those pathways, which through the briars that were so harshly trodden down, we're letting them become overgrown. And I think that one of the reasons of the fascination of women who break the rules is that their stories show us that we just can't forget the bravery, scorn, and humiliation that they faced. And in writing their stories, I feel that I'm sort of doing, doing my bit to keep us remembering. And there you go.